So let's get started. So this session is on competition law, uh, subtitle What Your Business Needs to Know. Um, by way of introduction, I am Charles Livingston. I'm a partner in the Government Regulation and Competition team at Brodie's. Uh, and my fellow speakers today are Damien Ryan, who's a senior associate in the team, and Jamie Dunn, who is an associate. And you can, uh, you can see from those images that unlike mine, Damien's beard is pre-COVID, um, which is possibly unusual in this day and age. Um, so uh, the overview of today's session, um, we're going to talk uh, a little bit about the drivers of competition law compliance, the reasons to comply with competition law. Um, we'll then take you through some of the key competition law risks, focusing on anti-competitive agreements, the, the big ticket items, um, some lesser understood risks, uh, particularly relating to working with or having contact with competitors. Uh, we'll talk about vertical agreements, which are relevant to businesses that are uh, up or down the supply chain. Um, we'll touch briefly on the rules around abuse as they relate to businesses that have a dominant position. Um, we'll then give you some tips about how to comply with competition law in practice, and then we will finish with our Q&A. So, <clears throat> The drivers of competition law compliance, or as uh, the next slide is headed, why should you care about competition law? Uh, so it's become stricter in recent years, um, to some extent in terms of its substance, uh, but most uh, significantly in terms of its enforcement. The number of investigations of competition law infringements is on the rise. Um, the UK regulator, the Competition and Markets Authority, has been increasingly aggressive both in the number of investigations it carries out and in the penalties it's pursuing against people who have breached the law. Um, and the CMA and other competition authorities um, put simply expect businesses to know the rules and to put in place compliance measures. Um, as you'll see as we go through, um, there is uh, ignorance of the law is no excuse, as the saying goes, and that's certainly true. Um, but competition law is an area where a lot of businesses don't necessarily understand uh, what it is they uh, can and can't do. Um, and that's notwithstanding that there are very significant consequences for breaches of competition law, which are set out on the next slide. Um, and the, the main uh, drivers for complying um, with competition law uh, are the sanctions for not doing so. And uh, the first one, the first bullet there may surprise you, reputational damage, but in fact that has been placed uh, as the most significant deterrent factor um, in surveys of businesses, um, which just goes to show how damaging a competition breach can be. In terms of the more regulatory focused uh, consequences, the most serious uh, hardcore infringements that we'll be speaking about later uh, carry a prison sentence of up to five years and an unlimited fine for those involved. Um, a breach uh, of any uh, aspect of competition law can lead to a fine uh, to the corporate entity of up to 10% of its global group turnover. Um, so if your business is part of a larger group, uh, you can get into very, very large cash uh, figures for competition fines. Directors, company directors can be disqualified uh, from being directors for up to 15 years. Uh, that's a um, penalty that the CMA has been pursuing particularly aggressively recently. They've gone, I think, from zero into double figures in the last uh, two years or something like that. They announced another one today. Um, damages actions, competitors or customers who lose out as a result of a breach can uh, use that as a basis for litigation. Um, and if your agreement is contrary to competition law, then it will be void and unenforceable, which obviously defeats uh, the point of having an agreement. Um, so uh, all of those consequences exist for breaking competition law. In terms of the likelihood of a breach being discovered, our next bullet point um, relates to whistleblowing. These are uh, policies introduced by competition regulators, including the CMA, that encourage uh, third parties to come forward with information about anti-competitive activity and they can receive rewards if they do. And indeed, they encourage the participants in anti-competitive activity to come forward um, because uh, the, the first uh, participant in an anti-competitive arrangement who uh, comes to the competition regulator and blows the whistle on the arrangement and on the other participants can receive full immunity from any uh, fines or uh, criminal sanctions uh, and from disqualification as well. So that is a, that is a very significant incentive um, that if you discover you might have an issue that you want to investigate it and potentially blow the whistle to the regulator before somebody else does. 
you should also keep in mind the cost of uh, anti-competitive behaviour where you might be the victim. So the CMA estimates that cartels can inflate the prices paid downstream of the cartelists by 30% or more. So being aware of competitional risks will help you spot those sorts of issues. Um, so on the next slide, We've got uh, some results of a survey that the CMA has carried out of businesses in terms of measuring their awareness of competition law. They did that in 2014 and again in 2018. And these figures here show um, the, the uh, results for each of those years. And it's striking from the first image that only 23% of businesses say that they know competition law either very well or fairly well, which means that uh, over three quarters of businesses at best know competition law not very well. Um, and that feeds through to uh, knowledge of the penalties as well, which are the bottom two bars. Um, so uh, there you have uh, only 7% of businesses say their knowledge is good or very good. Um, only 18% have a fair knowledge uh, and the vast majority have either poor or very poor uh, or don't know about the penalties. Um, so to some extent, uh, a lack of awareness of competition law means that businesses don't necessarily know uh, what it is they should be focusing on. And on the next slide, we can see that uh, that then uh, contributes to something of a vicious circle. Um, this is uh, the results of a survey of survey questions about businesses that have had uh, on the top senior level discussions and on the bottom training in relation to competition law as against uh, various other compliance issues. You can see health and safety and employment law get big numbers there, but competition law is the lowest of the ones that were offered. Um, so in 2018, 18% of businesses had senior level discussions in the last 12 months, only 6% had had training in the last 12 months. So we get into a bit of a vicious circle there. The lack of awareness means it's not discussed uh, the lack of appreciation of the risks means there isn't training. Um, and uh, those lack of discussions and lack of training then contribute to the lack of awareness of competition law. Um, so congratulations to you for joining uh, today. And uh, that will hopefully um, mean there's no vicious circle in your business because you will be aware of uh, what the potential issues are. Um, but just in terms of illustrating the results of how that vicious circle can contribute to awareness, our next slide shows that for um, the most serious breaches of competition law, which Jamie will speak to in a moment, um, the, the percentage of businesses who recognize these as illegal are not as high as you might hope. Um, now, I should say the survey didn't put uh, the breaches to them in, in quite such stark terms, um, but, but it, put, it put to businesses an arrangement that would qualify as price fixing or bid rigging or market sharing. And you can see that um, a bare majority of businesses recognize price fixing and bid rigging as potential breaches and only a minority of businesses recognize market sharing um, as breaches of competition law. Um, so it just illustrates that competition law, notwithstanding its very serious consequences for a business is often underappreciated um, as a, a risk. Um, but uh, hopefully today's session, if you are in that boat at the moment, you will not be by the end and we'll put some of that right. So um, on that note, uh, I will hand over to Jamie, um, who's going to cover uh, anti-competitive agreements uh, and uh, how you recognise competitional risks. Yep. Thanks, Charles. So um, to start off with, um, anti-competitive agreements. So this is um, agreements between undertakings, um, decisions of associations of undertakings and concerted practices that have the object or effect of preventing, restricting or distorting competition are prohibited and are void. And that's set out in the UK's Competition Act and in Article 101 of the Treaty on the Functioning of the European Union in EU law. Now, we talk about agreements, um, but it's easier to think of this in terms of coordination or arrangements um, between undertakings, because concerted practices, that, that last phrase that I used there, concerted practices is, is a very wide ranging um, thing and it can catch all sorts of arrangements. So the, the word agreements, um, as it is used in competition law, um, doesn't have a definition, a formal definition, and therefore it doesn't have easy loopholes to get out through. Um, it can include all sorts of conduct, 
<clears throat> both formal and informal, um, and including very loose arrangements, gentlemen's agreements, things like that. Um, so it's important to be aware that uh, even things that might seem very, um, very informal and unstructured can still constitute agreements in that sense um, for the purposes of competition law. So what is an undertaking? Um, I said it applies to agreements or practices between undertakings. Well, an undertaking is any entity that is engaged in economic activity. Um, it doesn't matter what the form of that entity is, so it doesn't have to be a company or a partnership or anything like that. It doesn't matter whether it's profit generating or not. Um, for example, a local authority gym um, would be an undertaking because it is an economic entity. It is participating on a market. It's offering services on a market. And any entity, regardless of its form or profit generating status or not, that, that acts on a market is an undertaking for the purposes of competition law. Um, a whole a corporate group will generally be considered to be a single undertaking, which means that agreements that would otherwise be anti-competitive that are between two entities in the same corporate group don't breach competition law. The downside to that apparent upside is that the fines that Charles mentioned a little bit ago um, apply to the entire corporate group. So you may have a very small um, subsidiary at the far reaches of the corporate tree doing something and it will be the entire corporate group's turnover that is taken into account when the authorities decide on how much the fine ought to be. Um, so hardcore breaches, these are the, the sort of really significant cartel type ones. Um, so just to unpack some of these a little bit more. Um, price fixing is where competitors agree or simply discuss their respective price levels or pricing intentions. So that can include components of pricing as well as the pricing itself, um, the margins or anticipated margins, rebates, planned rebates, advertised prices and the like. Um, bid rigging is, again, as it sounds on the tin, um, competitors agree uh, that they will bid, that one of them will bid for a contract or they will both bid for a contract on set agreed terms or that one or more of them won't bid on something at all. Um, and just, just to cover that last point briefly, it's all right, obviously, um, for, from a competition perspective to decide that, you know what, we're not interested in that opportunity. We don't want to bid for that thing as long as it is an autonomous decision that's not been discussed with any of the other potential or existing bidders, as long as things are done on an internal basis, autonomous basis, that's fine. But it's when things start to get into agreements or concerted practices between undertakings that there's a problem. So discussing bid rigging with your competitors, and that can be a particularly difficult thing at a time um, of economic uncertainty, particularly like right now, because it might well be that, you know, your priority and your competitors' priority is to preserve the jobs of the people that you have. And so it's tempting, very tempting, um, with the best of intentions to go to your competitor and say, you know what, we'll bid for that thing and not for the other one. You bid for the one we're not doing and not for the one we want to do, and then everyone can keep everyone they've currently got employed in their jobs. It's often done with the best of intentions. It is illegal, and it will result in a fine, if not um, other serious penalties as well. Market sharing. Um, so this is where competitors agree, or again, discuss um, the allocation of a territory, um, or a customer or a group of customers between them. So, for example, that's where you would say to your competitor um, in uh, England, if you're a Scottish company, oh, well, we won't sell in England if you don't sell in Scotland, or we won't target your biggest customer if you don't target our biggest customer, things like that, where you're effectively removing competition from the market by saying that you're not going to compete for something and they're not going to compete for something. It can actually, just to clarify, be unilateral as well. Um, you don't need to get something out of the other guy. Um, and then limiting supply. Um, another thing that can be very tempting at times like this, this is your OPEC style cartel where 
you simply agree that we'll all just make less because that will drive the price up. Whereas if we keep making what we're making now and people don't want so much, then it will drive the prices down and everyone making that thing or selling that service loses. Um, that you can't coordinate on things like that. If you think you're making too much of something and that the price for that is too low, you can unilaterally make less, but you just have to take the risk that your competitor will get a benefit from that. So um, to give an example of market sharing, because this is the one that, that is often the most considered the most confusing of those hardcore breaches that I just covered. So the example we've given here is um, a Dutch laundry cartel. So this was a group of laundry businesses that did work predominantly for healthcare institutions in the Netherlands. There were five businesses. They were each allocated their own district to operate in. And they were the agreement between them said that each of them could only operate in their own allocated district and they could not go to or compete for customers outside that district in somebody else's district. Um, and four of them were fined between half a million and 13 and a half million euros for participation in that cartel. Um, there have been similar cases in the UK. Um, in fact, two UK specialist laundry services um, that deal in uh, sterile workwear uh, were fined a total of 1.7 million pounds in 2018 for dividing up um, into two Ter dividing up England into two territories. Um, so the rules are the same and the fines are going to be roughly the same for this type of thing. Um, working with and or contact with your competitors. So this is something, not your hardcore breaches, um, but it's still a big risk area from a competition perspective. Um, it's okay for competitors to work together in certain circumstances, otherwise joint ventures wouldn't be a thing. The key thing is that those, that working together can't be anti-competitive. And it is possible for it to be pro-competitive. Um, the, the first example that I've given there is um, where you may have a consortium to um, fulfill a larger contract and think to uh, building businesses that join together because they want to service a contract that neither one of them is big enough to do on their own but if they team up they can divide it up for that customer and um, they can do it together that's okay as long as neither of them could have done it on their own if they could have done it on their own if, if both of them could have done it on their own then they should be competing with each other and not teaming up to offer a consortium bid for something like that um, and other examples of pro-competitive um, arrangements can include where companies work together to bring new products or services to a market or to facilitate research and development into, into new things. Um, the key thing is that in any of these cases, that cooperation between competitors can't go further than necessary to achieve whatever legitimate outcome is being aimed at. Um, so strict separation of responsibilities, um, Chinese walls inside these companies, you know, if, if to use my example of the building consortium, the, the people that are focusing on that bid, that consortium bid or the joint venture or whatever it is, shouldn't be, can't be the same people that are then doing the pricing for other customers where those two companies are competing with each other. You've got to put firm lines in place to avoid um, creating that sort of potential for things to go wrong. Um, and and that's, that's that second point, no coordinating things that could be sold independently and, and joint purchasing can be a, a particular risk which really just needs to be considered and, and receive legal advice on a sort of case specific basis. Um, contact with competitors um, is generally speaking something that authorities are going to be pretty suspicious of. Now competition works best, um, the theory is competition works best when competitors don't know what each other are doing, they don't know what each other's plans are. If you don't know what your competitor is doing, you have to take risks and often those risks will benefit customers because you will cut your prices too much or make more of something than there is demand for and so on. So competition regulators like uncertainty and co contact between competitors has a tendency to remove that. So businesses um, are not allowed to exchange commercially sensitive information. It's, it's generally speaking illegal to give 
or receive commercially sensitive information to or from your competitor. So what type of thing might be included there? Well, your prices, revenues, margins, anything like that, sales details, what marketing you plan on doing, who you plan on going after next, um, if you're planning on shutting down a plant for a period of time, if you're planning on expanding your business or retrenching it, anything like that, um, type of information exchange will generally be prohibited. It's okay to obtain that from public sources, from your own market intelligence. You know, you can go on your competitor's website and have a wee look at what they've put out in the public domain. Um, your customers can provide you with information, but it's important to be wary about what, what we think, what we call indirect information exchange or what's sometimes known as a hub and spoke cartel, where A passes information to B to pass information to C and A and C are competitors. Um, that's a particular risk for trade associations. They are inherently groups of competitors through which that type of information can pass. So we've, used, we've given a, um, a little case study here um, on information sharing and um, it's been anonymized to, um, to protect those uh, involved, but uh, it's, it's, a, it's a public record case anyway, it's a real case. Um, so three companies um, admitted colluding with a fourth company to share the market um, by dividing customers among themselves to fix prices of um, galvanized steel tanks um, and to rig bids for contracts. Um, so company D, blew the whistle, this is what Charles was mentioning earlier, gets immunity from fines and prosecution. Companies A, B and C, meanwhile, were fined between 22,000 and two million pounds. Now, um, obviously they've all been anonymized, but to take company A as the one that was fined two million, to put that in context, their turnover that year was just shy of seven million pounds and their profit before the fine was 70,000 pounds. After the fine, that became a 1.6 million pound loss for that year, um, which actually was the first year they turned a profit in a while to begin with. And bearing in mind, they also had to pay tax before their pre, on their pre-fine profits as if the fine hadn't been incurred because obviously a fine is not tax deductible. Um, wait a minute, I hear you say, uh, I thought fines were capped at 10% of turnover. Well, yes, but when the cartel lasts longer than a year, the regulations allow the CME to take turnover into other, in other years into account. And this one lasted for almost eight years. So they ended up paying um, just shy of 30% of their turnover for the year in question. Um, a, B and C had also exchanged information on um, current pricing and their future intentions with another company, Company E, including a discussion of target price ranges. Um, now, Company E was invited to join the cartel, um, come into our market sharing group. Company E said no, um, but it still was present at a meeting where commercially sensitive information was exchanged. Company E, which just remember, refused to join the cartel was fined £130,000 just for being in that meeting where information was exchanged. So trade associations, which I've mentioned briefly, perfectly legal to participate in those, but members are generally going to be competitors by the very nature of trade associations. Um, so there's a high risk of anti-competitive conduct in those circumstances. Um, and the risks are often the highest during those informal unminuted, unsupervised or chaired bits. So coffee breaks are risky, drinks receptions are risky because people become a little bit more loose-lipped and may say something not thinking it's commercially sensitive when it is. Um, and it's important to remember, particularly if you are running or involved in running a trade association, that the trade association is itself subject to competition rules. It is an, ent an undertaking, it is an entity that um, can be held accountable for this. And where it is taking in information from company A um, and passing it to company B through the trade association, that is that hub and spoke cartel that I mentioned that can um, see sensitive information exchange between competitors. The fact it happens via the trade association doesn't stop it being against the law. Um, and the same is true for things like setting guide prices or pricing recommendations or setting um, standards for its members. These can all effectively be um, 
coordinative behavior um, to reduce competition by object or effect. Um, so how to mitigate the risks um, on um, trade meetings at trade associations and the like? Well, the general rule is the better the note of the meeting, the better um, anyone attending a trade association or similar meeting from your business should make sure that they are well briefed before they go in, that they make very good notes while they're there that they keep any business related conversations very high level and not commercially sensitive. Um, it's perfectly acceptable to discuss common white, common industry issues. You know, um, we're facing, uh, we're all facing um, new regulations that are coming in. We're all facing compliance issues, health and safety issues, um, employment and training issues, things, things which are common to everyone. Um, it just, you can't exchange anything that's commercially sensitive. Um, and policing and lobbying initiatives and things like that can be discussed as well, as long as what you're not discussing is what you will then do with the outcome of that. Um, and it's very key to note that there is an obligation to halt any suspect discussion as soon as possible. It's as company E learned um, in the example we've just given, you can't just sit and listen um, and whatever. There is an obligation on somebody at a trade association meeting or any meeting between competitors to put their hand up and say, I'm sorry, we can't discuss this. We have to stop. And if it doesn't stop to leave the room, have it minuted, they've left the room. Um, and that's how you stop yourself getting in trouble for things like that. So I'm going to hand over to Damien now to talk about vertical agreements. Thank you, Jamie. And thank you, Charles. Um, so I'm talking about vertical agreements and starting at the very beginning as to what vertical agreements are. Um, so vertical agreements are agreements between undertakings which are at different level of the supply chain. So we're not talking about agreements between two competitors which are providing the same or selling the same product. We're talking about agreements between, for example, a manufacturer to its buyer or distributor, or perhaps then maybe even on to a retailer. And as a general rule, um, those agreements are not problematic. That is to say, they're not problematic as long as one of the parties doesn't have a very significant market share, so in excess of 30%. Um, because such a significant market share would reflect its power to influence um, the market. Um, but also importantly, as long as um, it is not, they do not touch on certain restrictions and competition. And we're going to look at three key issues um, where if the agreements touch on these issues, you're looking at uh, an agreement which is potentially um, problematic. Um, so the first is in relation to prices. Um, second being in relation to some exclusive arrangements and in particular for online selling and we appreciate that online selling is becoming um, an important issue for businesses um, increasingly so um, since since the COVID crisis um, and then finally um, we'll talk about non-compete clauses. So to start with resale price maintenance. Um, Resale price maintenance is a, is a very simple idea. Um, it's where a supplier sells a product to the buyer and then as a condition of that sale says that you cannot sell it below a, a certain price. That's obviously a distorting price within the market um, and is considered to be anti-competitive. Um, it, it can come about by some indirect means. Um, so whereas the concept itself is very simple, sometimes the complexity in identifying it comes from the manner in which it is implemented. So whether that's through minimum margins or a particular scheme of discounts or in actual fact, the way recommended retail prices, prices um, are communicated. You can have a recommended retail price. However, it must be a genuine recommendation. Um, it's sometimes not realized that it's a hardcore restriction and that's reflected in the penalties which, which are imposed. Um, and we will have a look at some penalties which have been imposed um, by the CMA in, in recent cases um, a little bit later. Um, maximum advertised pricing might also be considered equivalent to um, retail price maintenance. That's in particular online because if product is advertised online um, at a particular minimum price, you don't see it open to you to negotiate 
um, a, a lower price. So that is seen as, in effect, de facto imposing um, a, a minimum retail price. Um, finally, a ban on online sales are considered to be anti-competitive. That that would distort the market in that it protects sales of products in bricks and mortar shops, um, which is which is not allowed. And there's special protection really afforded um, to online sales, sales, which we will discuss um, a, a little bit more. So moving on to the retail price maintenance case studies, um, there are five studies there in the slides, which go to show the, the seriousness um, which the CMA attributes to that, that type of offence. Um, the first two describe the um, minimum setting of advertising online prices, um, where the CMA imposed fines of 2.3 million and 785,000 for that, that very um, offence. Um, once again, as I said, because if a product is, is advertised at a minimum price online, um, that is in effect fixing the price at, at that level. Um, the last two cases, um, I think, are particularly interesting given the, the size of the amount of fine which, which was imposed. Um, when you look at the Casio case, um, which was discounted from 4.6 million when it was originally imposed, um, the ultimate fine which was imposed was still 40% of the turnover for the particular product to which the offence related, related to. Um, and the size of that fine must once again be an indication of the seriousness um, of, of the offence. Um, the Fender fine um, was one which was imposed quite recently, um, only earlier on uh, this year. Um, and what was interesting there was that the employees had sought to avoid its detection by not putting into writing the fact that they were implementing this policy. But as was discussed earlier on, as can now be quite common, there was a whistleblowing, um, there was a tip-off, um, and ultimately F Fender were found out as having implementing this, this anti-competitive um, policy. Um, so moving on to uh, restrictions on resale activity. Um, so a supplier cannot completely restrict either the territory into which the buyer sells or the customers to which it sells. Now, when I say completely, it is possible to restrict active sales into a territory. And act by active, I mean purposefully going out and chasing a particular sale in that territory, um, where that territory has been assigned to a designated um, distributor. Um, that is not the case in relation to passive sales. Um, and the distinction between active and passive sales are very important. And as I say, now that more and more sales um, are going online, it's, it's an important distinction for businesses to, to be aware of. Um, so digging a little deeper into the distinction between active and passive sales, um, which, um, so active sales, um, as I have said, is where you proactively approach customers by direct mail, um, unsolicited emails, visits, um, where you are with purpose and intent going after sales um, within a, a particular jurisdiction. Passive sales is where it comes to you, um, where you haven't taken any such steps, um, but nevertheless, you have had a general inquiry or response to general advertising, um, and you cannot place a restriction on those type of passive sales. So active sales, yes, you can, um, where there, there's already been an allocation of a jurisdiction or territory um, to a distributor. Um, passive sales, you, you cannot. Um, and it simply reflects the fact, once again, that both the CMA and the Commission see online sales as contributing significantly, significantly to stimulating competition. Um, and therefore, anything which, which restricts that will be considered to be, um, to be potentially anti-competitive. Um, one slight exception to that, um, or point that, that we should make is in relation to third party platforms. Um, it's not the case that you will be required or you as in a manufacturer or supplier will be required to allow um, entities further down the supply chain, buyers put products on every platform. They, they are entitled to be 
um, somewhat selective if they think a product isn't appropriate for Amazon, for example. Um, but this idea of putting a blanket ban on advertising products online um, simply will not permit it. Um, and I think the Ping case study is a useful example of that. Um, Ping, as, as you will know, are manufacturers of golf clubs. And what they basically sought to do was restrict the sale of their product online um, on the basis that they said that the integrity of the product, the um, having that sophisticated a product, required the product to be fitted to the individual. So that in order to have bespoke golf clubs, you would then need to attend at their store um, and have them fitted to you. So it wasn't an arbitrary prohibition or, or ban which they were imposing. Um, but nevertheless, the CMA believed it was anti-competitive and imposed a very significant fine. And the reasoning was very simple. It was that if you have to go to the local store, albeit to have your golf clubs fitted, it means you can't go online and then start shopping around and getting the cheapest price possible. It also means that there is a practical restriction in that you're going to go to your, your nearest store to get um, fitted. And therefore you're to an extent inhibiting competition between those stores because as I said, you're going to go to the one which is within a, a reasonable geographic, um, within a re reasonable geographic area. So then moving on, um, finally, just to talk about non-compete clauses. Um, non-compete clauses in a vertical agreement are also problematic. So this arises where the buyer is obliged to purchase its requirements from the supplier, either um, exclusively or in excess of, of 80%. Um, that is a problem if the duration of that non-compete is going to be in excess of five years. And to point out there where it's for an indefinite duration or it's a rolling contract, it will be presumed, presumed to exceed um, five years. Um, and it's also the case that where there is a non-compete clause post termination of the agreement to not purchase or sell or resell um, services, that is unlikely to be allowed. So back to you, Jamie. Thanks, Damien. Um, so just to talk about abuse of dominance for a moment. Um, abuse of dominance is another big uh, area of competition law. Um, and dominance is an important issue, um, not just for dominant companies, dominant undertakings, um, but also for anybody who deals with them. You know, you, you may um, have quite a small business um, or a business that works in a very competitive market, um, but nonetheless deal with dominant businesses and therefore dominance um, can be an issue for, for pretty much anyone. Um, so what is abuse of a dominant position? Well, um, the, the key rule is that an undertaking that is in a dominant position is prohibited from abusing that that dominance um, and that's set out in again the Competition Act this time chapter 2 and in article 102 of the Treaty on the Functioning of the European Union. Um, so there's a couple of things to unpack there. Um, the first key one is that um, being in a dominant market position is not in itself a breach of any uh, rule or law. Uh, you are perfectly um, able to uh, grow your business to a position of dominance. Um, you are able to hold a dominant market position, um, subject obviously to uh, merger control issues. Um, but what there are restrictions on are what dominant businesses can do. That is to say that there are certain business activities that are perfectly legal and in fact perfectly normal for most businesses but that dominant businesses are prohibited from engaging in. Um, so what is a dominant business? Well, rule of thumb is a 50% market share plus. Um, anything below 40% and you're pretty much presumed not to be dominant um, with a bit of a tricky area in between. Um, but it's very much done on a case by case basis um, and um, firms may find that they are dominant in some markets and not in others. It's very much a risk based thing. It's hard to be absolutely definitive as a matter of law. Um, it's, uh, I, think, I, think, I think the key thing really there is that um, to be dominant 
means being independent of control of competitive forces. It basically means that you're not subject to normal market competition in the way that a non-dominant business would be. And these things are just used as um, ways of, of figuring out whether you are likely to be in that position. So what type of thing um, is a dominant business prohibited from doing? Uh, if we just move on to the next slide there, um, is uh, there's not there's not a mass a defined list, um, but there are a number of activities that a dominant business cannot engage in in the same way that another business could. So, um, engaging in exclusivity agreements, um, particularly um, where um, a customer may need access to something that they control, um, discriminatory pricing or terms of dealing, and a, a dominant business has to treat like customers alike and unlike customers unlike, you can give preferential terms to, for example, a customer who is buying a lot more, um, just, but as long as these things can be justified on an objective basis, that's the key point. A dominant business can't refuse to deal with a customer outright, um, and where it controls something that is what's called an essential facility, i.e. it's needed for somebody else to run their business, um, then um, access has to be given on a fair, reasonable and non-discriminatory basis. A uh, dominant business can't engage in tying or bundling. So what I mean by that is saying that we will only sell you product A if you also buy product B, or saying that product A and product B come together. Um, both of those perfectly normal things can't be done by a dominant business because it would allow a dominant business to use its dominance in one area to benefit its businesses, business in another. So think Google sticking its own shopping results high up on Google search. Um, loyalty inducing rebates and discounts are prohibited on part of dominant businesses um, because it ha can have the effect of stopping um, compete competitors competing for that small sliver of extra business that they might be big enough to support um, because they can't they just can't compete with the, the loyalty rebate. Um, as I mentioned, access to essential facilities there, predatory pricing. Um, now that's a complicated area um, but the key thing is that the competition authorities will view it as abuse of dominance if it is costing you more to as a dominant if you're a dominant business and it is costing you more to produce something a good or offer a service than you are making marginally from that because they will assume you are doing that to drive somebody else out of business and then will put your prices up to a higher level once your competitor is gone why else would you be doing it on a loss-making basis? Um, An excessive unfair pricing, flip side of that coin, a dominant business cannot use its dominance, its control of a market to apply excessive or unfair prices to its customers. So I'm now going to hand you back to Charles um, to talk about competition compliance in practice. Thanks, Jamie. Um, so we're just going to give you uh, some insight into uh, what the regulator expects and how we generally support uh, clients with compliance issues. Um, so the CMA's view, its approach to compliance is that it's important for businesses to foster a culture of compliance. And that starts at the top. It needs to be led by directors and senior managers. It will include things like a high level policy commitment, um, making sure that compliance is supported and reinforced on a regular basis uh, and visibly um, with communications coming from the senior leadership. Uh, all directors within a business will have some responsibility for compliance and therefore the CMA will say that if there is a breach, the risk of disqualification um, will uh, fall not evenly um, across all directors. Those who are most directly involved will be at the highest risk, but all directors will carry some risk of that if they have not been doing what they could have been expected to do to try and ensure that the business would comply. Um, but although it starts at the top, compliance needs to be everyone's responsibility. And if a culture of compliance has been fostered successfully, everyone will feel a responsibility for ensuring the business complies. Um, and it's worth noting that um, the, I mean, the main benefit of compliance is to not have a breach and to not incur fines and that sort of thing. But if a breach nevertheless occurs, the fact that compliance efforts had been made um, uh, and uh, the breach was by a bad apple who wasn't um, going along with the compliance requirements, that may reduce fine levels and the risks of disqualification. 
Um, in terms of some practical tips on how to put that into effect, um, it's important that you have some understanding of competition law and uh, hopefully today we'll have assisted you with that. But it's very important that, that you understand not just competition law generally, but where the key risks are for your business. So for example, does your business operate in, constant, in one or more concentrated markets where there's you and maybe only one or two other competitors that creates risk? Um, are you working in partnership with any competitors? Um, are, are you or your people members of trade associations? Do you work in a sector or an area where there's lots of contact between different competitors? Airlines have been fined lots of times for cartel behavior. And one of the contributing factors to that is that almost by definition, they are almost always near each other in the vicinity of airports. High staff turnover between competitors can create risk. Um, it means that uh, if, you are, if you bring someone over from a competitor, they will still have plenty of contacts and friends at that competitor scale that up with lots of moves between businesses and you can be in a risky environment. Um, do you operate vertical agreements, in which case you need to understand the risks that Damien was talking about? Uh, are you potentially dominant, in which case it's very important that you think about um, what limitations there might be on you, as Jamie was outlining. And you also need to be aware of where within your business the risks for you are most likely to arise. Sales teams are almost always pretty high up on that uh, list of risk areas. Um, but you might also have risks in your procurement team, the people who are buying things for you. There might be risks in your HR department. If you do have lots of staff turnover and you interview lots of people from competitors, it's important that your HR team know not to ask them what's going on at company X while they're still working for company X because that can be an exchange of commercially sensitive information. Uh, and your board, the risks might be at your board. You might have non-execs who sit on lots of different companies, possibly including competitors. Um, there might be lots of contact between chief execs uh, on trade associations, that sort of thing. So it's important to review these things and understand how the risks apply to you. Um, I mentioned policies. Uh, so in terms of appropriate policies and procedures, something we regularly assist clients with. Um, and and what, uh, what we look to put in place is a plain English compliance manual that's suitable and accessible for all staff um, that sets out the business's policy position on compliance, uh, what the risks are for that business, what the duties are, what mitigation steps people should take. Um, and uh, one of the main uh, purposes of these policies is to set out what the procedures are for seeking advice and reporting concerns. Because if people don't know that, they might know about competition law, but if they don't know how to report that, they may just sit on that, just freeze up because they don't know where to take it. Um, and also, if your policy sets out what the sanctions are for breaching competition law, it'll be much easier for you if you are so minded to take enforcement action internally against an individual who breaches it. Um, any training is important as, as useful as today's uh, more general training has hopefully been, um, it's important that as part of your compliance steps, your training is tailored to focus on the risks that have been identified for your business um, and uh, indeed tailored further to the recipients of the training. So management and staff in higher risk areas will get more detailed training, whereas others who are lower risk but still need to know about it may get something of a more general overview. Um, the policies, the training, they all have to be properly targeted and they all have to be supported from the top. Um, what then do you do if you think there might have been a breach of competition law in your business or indeed if you are investigated? Um, well, if the CMA or somebody else uh, turns up at your door uh, with a team carrying out a dawn raid, um, not a dawn raid, they always happen at half past nine on a Tuesday, but uh, they're called dawn raids. Um, if they turn up at your door, uh, get in touch um, with us, uh, if, or uh, if you can't get hold of us, there are other firms available. Um, but make sure that you're seeking legal advice as soon as you can if you suspect a breach. The reason I've said external, um, if we have in-house lawyers in the audience, um, EU law does not confer privilege on advice from in-house lawyers. Um, and you may not know whether uh, a particular breach will engage UK or EU competition law. So it's always better to err on the side of getting external advice. Um, keep the number of people who know about the breach as small as possible uh, and investigate the position quickly but thoroughly. Um, and uh, if, if you are not yet being investigated, if you've been fortunate enough to discover that there's a breach before 
that's come to light elsewhere, um, then you should blow the whistle uh, to the regulators as soon as you have enough evidence to support that. Um, you shouldn't rush into disciplinary action because cooperation of the individuals involved might be essential. Um, and uh, you also should remember that you might be the victim of anti-competitive behavior, like I said earlier. Um, apologies, you can probably hear my four-year-old trying to get into the room. Um, so that is uh, our compliance um, tips. Uh, I've got uh, a few questions here. Um, I think we can move on to the Q&A slide. Um, so I've got a few questions here. We've got 10 minutes. So if you want to get one in, I think we'll have time uh, to add one or two more. So just submit one with the Q&A. Um, but first question I have here, uh, in fact, I've got two, Jamie, that I'll probably take together and put to you because they're both about sort of information exchange. Sure. Um, so one, can a, can a customer play suppliers off against each other by saying what the other would charge or, or is that the hub and spoke you were talking about? Um, and uh, if trade associations are publishing industry-wide information, is that okay? Okay, so to take the, them in that order then, um, it's, it's legal essentially to receive um, information from your customers, um, provided that the customer is not um, simply acting as a conduit through which um, commercially sensitive information is in fact being provided by one competitor to another. Um, so um, to, to kind of put that in sort of practical example is your customer might come to you and say, well, your competitor is offering me um, is offering me this thing for this price. Um, are you going to beat it or match it? Um, and you still have uncertainty there. You don't know if that's true or you don't know what other prices that competitor might be willing to offer. Um, and that, and that, and, and, the customer is essentially trying to set you off against each other. Um, in those in instances, you have not received um, commercially sensitive information. You've received, received essentially um, public information, information that's been released to that competitor. Um, the, the risk to guard against really is that in certain circumstances, the customer may be being used as a way of exchanging that information. Um, and that's really where you want some sort of compliance program to make sure that your people um, and uh, are, are aware that um, things like that are risky and are not um, in fact trying to exchange information because if it's investigated and there are internal emails saying let's release it this way then that's where problems begin. Um, in terms of um, trade association um, publishing industry-wide information, um, the the key thing is, again, it's not commercially sensitive information about any one entity. Um, so trade associations, the advice is generally make sure that any information that is taken in is then aggregated, anonymized and historic before it is shared back out again so that it doesn't let anyone see what their competitors are doing. Yeah, okay, thanks, Jamie. Um, I'm gonna put this question to Damien because uh, this is uh, something that we've been working on. Damien's written a couple of things about. Um, are, the, are the rules still applying as normal just now or is there some allowance for the fact that businesses are in difficulty? Um, thanks, Charles. Are the rules still applying? Well, the short answer is yes, uh, absolutely they are. Um, in the media, there were some relaxation of the rules um, announced, and I think it led to a misperception that competition law didn't apply for a short period of time. In actual fact, what was allowed, well, first of all, was some guidance from the CMA, which said for the purposes of essential services, some coordination between competitors would be allowed to ensure that essential services and products were, were supplied during a, a period of, of emergency or of crisis. That was then formalized into specific orders, which Charles is, is mentioning. We wrote about um, the order in respect of the groceries order and um, in respect of the dairy sector. But I think the important thing to remember about those is that they're actually quite specific. It's quite specific what you're allowed to do during the period, um, and it's quite limited, the services and the industry sector um, to, to which they apply. Um, if you're seeking the benefit of those, um, it's 
probably best to first get um, advice in particular because to actually avail of those orders, um, you need to make a formal notification to, to the Secretary of State um, in, in any event. Okay, thanks, Damien. Um, Jamie, I think this is going back to a reference on the slide about trade associations. Um, standards were mentioned as a, as a risky area. Um, so why is that a potential issue? Um, yeah, I mean, this, this is, is, is something that um, sometimes trade associations um, can, can come up against. Um, and essentially, the, the problem is where it's being... The problem is that there is a potential for standard setting in a trade association to effectively be a front by which um, incumbents in a market protect themselves against competition from new entrants and potential new competitors. Um, so the key thing really is that where standards are are agreed, there's a very clear link to the benefit that will come to consumers from agreeing those standards. You know, think in terms of um, how everyone's pretty much every everyone's electronic devices use the same USB leads now to charge. There's a very clear benefit to customers from doing that and having um, competitors agree um, through things like trade associations to all use the same charging um, facilities um, has a very clear benefit um, and it doesn't create a massive obstacle to new people getting in the market. In fact, they can benefit simply by being able to do that too. Um, the problem becomes when trade associations create new standards which um, Either, either entrench existing um, ways of doing things and block out um, new innovators, even though there is no, for example, health and safety or whatever other risk from that innovation, um, or where they simply create standards that they themselves are capable of meeting, but that a small entrant might not be able to meet because of its size or scale or, or um, experience. So um, the, the key thing is that anything that's agreed as a standard in a trade association or similar has to have a very clear link to the customer benefit, and it has to be an objective thing. Okay, thank you. Um, I think we'll take one more question, Damien. This is a vertical agreement one, so for you. Um, can suppliers impose maximum resale to minimum ones? Yes, they can. Um, the prohibition against um, prices was that you are preventing the customer, the buyer, from getting the benefit of um, free market lowering of, of prices. There's no potential damage to a, to a customer if you're setting a maximum um, resale price because um, they're getting, they're getting, they're not, you're not going to prevent them, um, or sorry, I should say, you're not going to stop products being sold above a certain cost. People don't have a problem with that. Yeah. Thank you. Um, okay, thanks guys. Uh, so if we can just move on to the last slide, everybody will see our contact details. Um, if you have a question uh, that we either didn't get to or uh, that you didn't want us to answer in open forum, um, please feel free to get in touch. Um, you will get uh, a link to the recording of this webinar if you want to watch anything back. Um, but if there are any questions, then you'll have our contact contact details so now or in the future please don't hesitate to get in touch and otherwise thank you very much for your time goodbye thank you very much thank you